All right, the best bantamweight in Utah is back up for a strap on May 31st, live from the Maverick Center. It is Joel Haro. Joel, my good friend, how are you, man? It's great to talk to you. I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for having me back. It feels good to be back on the podcast. Um, yeah, I'm doing great. How about yourself, dude? Doing wonderful, man. I wish we were in person like last time, but no UFC 278 keeping us together. Uh, me down in Southern Utah, you up north. But no. how are you feeling leading into this upcoming fight? You're back up for a belt for the first time in about a year and a half. How are you feeling leading into this one? Dude, I feel great. My mindset is sharp. Uh, my training has been going awesome. Uh, I'm literally in the best shape of my life that I've ever been for a fight. So you know, I'm ready, man. I'm ready, really, really ready for this fight. Um, honestly, it's a fight that I've I was looking at trying to defend my belt when I first when I first won the belt. So, um, yeah, dude, I'm feeling great. I feel great. I definitely want to talk about your February showing, but you did bring up something that I was going to ask later on, and that is Michael Sear. Have you had it? You seem to have had your eye on him for a while now. When did he kind of get onto your radar? Um, you know. When I, uh, let's see, I think it was after, I think it was after I fought, uh, Steven Steyerwald, um, uh, I was given a name, Cameron Jordan to fight for my next fight. And so obviously as a fighter, I researched my opponent and, uh, Michael, uh, is it Sire or Sear? Sear. Anyway, Michael had fought and had fought, uh, Cameron Jordan. So then I, uh, obviously I watched that fight and, um, that opponent I was supposed to fight had lost to him. I was like, dang, that's a, he's pretty good. Like I can see myself fighting him. That's a fight I would want, especially when I win the belt. Um, obviously we went different routes at the time, but now circle back we're fighting. So this is one that's kind of been on your radar for a long time. That's very interesting. How often, I mean, you call fights for fierce. Obviously you watch a lot of the fights. How often when you see these pro bantamweights or even these amateurs coming up, do you look and you think I might be fighting them one of these days? Oh, I mean, when I'm calling fights, um, I'll be honest, I don't really think about it too much just because like I'm there doing my job calling the fights. But then, uh, you know, when I'm researching other fighters or just watching fights in general, when I'm not calling fights, I'm like, dang, that'd be a really good uh, potential fight. Um, you know, kind of like what I did with Michael Sear. I was just like, dang, I could definitely see myself fighting him. He's a very good competitor, very good fighter. And uh, I'm always up for the challenge, man. Like that's something that I pride myself. I don't, I try not to shy away from challenges and I love challenging myself. And I've been in this sport for a long time and um, you know, we have similar records and dude, this is going to be the main event and I can't ask for a better, better car to do it on in my home hometown. So should be fun. Well, let's talk about fight of the nights. Let's talk about you fighting in Utah this past February, Albara at me, obviously the fight of the night, Back and forth battle between you two. You get the nod on all three judges' scorecards, three rounds to none. When you were going to the center of the cage and Jackson was announcing it, did you know that you had won all three rounds or was there a toss up of any sort? Were you worried at all that there might be a split or something like that? No, not at all. I knew I knew I won the fight. Um, the only thing that did kind of have me a little worried, but I didn't, I knew I won the fight, but like kind of had me worried because he did land that spinning elbow in the last 10 seconds, kind of buckled me a little bit, but I was still there ready to keep engaging. Um, but I had no worries going into the, into the judges scorecards. I knew, I, I knew I won. I was hitting him on every angle. I cut every combination I threw was landing. Um, had him rocked in the first round, had him rocked in the, uh, third round. And, uh, even when he was trying to take me down, I got back up fought off the cage. Um, I'll be honest, dude, I could have done a whole lot better fighting off of the cage, but you know, we're going to be our own worst critics. So, but yeah, going into the judges scorecards, dude, I knew I won that fight. Um, I know there was a little, uh, unhappy feelings from the other team thinking, Oh yeah, we won that fight for sure. Or at least about the scorecards. I don't know what it was about, but you know, bottom line, I won and I uh, did everything I could to win. Did you know that you were going to do the point? Did you know that that was something that you wanted to do or was that on the spot? Like ever, I mean, we've thrown it on social media a million times, but that For is sure. one of the wildest like moments I think I have ever seen in the first cage. Dude, honestly, um, during fight camp, like I, I had actually rewatched that Leon Edwards, Nate Diaz fight like multiple times. Um, 
And I was just, you know, in the back of my head, joking around with the family, with my friends, the team. I'm just like, I'm going to hit this guy with a spinning elbow. I'm going to point at him, you know, just kind of making jokes, laughing it off. Um, and I totally forgot about it until literally in the moment I hit, I hit that, rocked him. I was like, oh, dude, I got you. I got you. You know what I mean? And I actually did the point. And uh, I know, uh, you know, in the moment, it was cool to do. It was fun to do. In my head, I was like, yes, that's my Nate Diaz moment, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'll be honest, dude, like a week after the fight, I rewatched it. I was like, dude, that was cool. But like, you should have just went in for the kill and finished him. It would have been better to finish him. But it, I mean, it is what it is. You know, uh, we're in the entertainment business too. So you got to entertain the fans and, you know, you got to, you got to do what you got to do. You know what I mean? Did Bobby and Pedro like the point as much as the rest of the masses did? <laughs> that, I don't know, man. Uh, we never really talked about it. Like we kind of <laughs> laughed about it, but we never really like sat down and been like, why did you do that? You know what I mean? Um, and like the whole the way that whole situation played out, um, re like watching the raw footage, you hear his corner put him up against the fence and elbow him, and then you hear Bobby King, yeah, let's try that. And I walk backwards to the fence and then hit the spinning elbow, and so that's another reason why I pointed at him too, because I was like, your corner just told you to do that, and I just did it to you. You know what I mean? Um, but then, you know, obviously he did it back to me. So <laughs> bragging rights for the both of us, I guess, right? You mentioned watching Leon Edwards and Nate Diaz back. Do you watch a lot of fights back specifically in camp to kind of visualize and, and get used to being in the cage again? Because, I mean, you only fight, you know, once every two to six months, it might be. Sort of. Not really. Like, out of like, I'll be honest, dude, fighting is the only sport I even pay attention to. Um, I grew up playing baseball, grew up playing soccer, like all the other sports. Right. But once I found wrestling and like training and martial arts, I'm just like, that's my sport. Um, so I, I mean, I watch fights all the time. Um, and especially when I'm in camp too, I like watching when I'm running, um, when I'm doing my long distant, distant runs, I love watching fights. I love just seeing the game because a, it passes a time by when I'm running and I'm constantly upping my speed. If I'm running on the treadmill to, you know, push the pace a little bit, but also just to be like, you know, I guess so kind of being in the mindset of fighting and um, just studying different fighters out there, you know, you know, the last time we spoke nearly a year ago, this was a much more somber interview talking about your first loss, which wasn't the easiest one. And then kind of a long road to get back. It, it was nearly a year before you were able to make that walk. Once again, mm -hmm. going into this February fight, this past February fight, did you feel doubted or did you feel your back against the wall in any way? What were your emotions like coming off of a loss versus your previous fights coming off of wins? Uh, you know, I had zero thought of what if I lose? What if I do this? What if, you know, I didn't feel any pressure at all. And honestly, I don't feel any pressure for this fight at all e either, because if you, if you're feeling all that pressure, I, in my eyes, in my opinion, you didn't do enough to prepare for the spotlight. You didn't prepare enough for your, for your fight or whatever it may be. Right. Um, and, you know, I made a lot of changes. I invested a lot into my, my previous fight camp and I invested a lot for this current fight camp as well. And it literally is all in the, pre the preparation and the mindset that you put yourself in, you know, cause I've, I've lost multiple times in my amateur career. I've lost, uh, Muay Thai uh, title fights. I've lost amateur MMA fights. And um, yeah, losing sucks. It definitely does for sure. Um, but at the same time, it's what you do after that loss that's going to propel you to the next level. If you dwell on that loss, then it's not, you're not going to progress. You're just going to stay stagnant in wherever you're at. And, uh, you know, at, like going into that fight, dude, like I, I mean, we all know it wasn't the same me that was in there fighting uh, Yazin. You know, I I had so much going on in that fight camp to injuries, to losing a, uh, a one of my students and in and just life in general. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, a loss is a loss. You know, it's part of life. You know what I mean? So you can't really dwell on it too much. You just got to keep moving forward. Let's talk a little bit about your prep specifically. I know you went up to Denver and you just mentioned you're going to be 
heading back over there uh, in just a couple of days. What is that process like getting there? And, and how did you kind of get involved over there? I know that's Bang Muay Thai headquarters. So is that kind of the way that you found your way up there for some of your training camps? Yeah, um, I started training out uh, at headquarters um, with Sensei Dwayne Ludwig when I was training for the uh, Steyerwalt fight. And when I was going out there, I would only go out there from like Wednesday to Saturday, just get my training in, then come home and then go back out again, you know. Um, but this last camp, um, some of the Utah community here may know who Casey Radden is. He trains out at HQ as well. And, uh, was also training out of high altitude martial arts, uh, also known as team elevation. And we've always crossed paths. We've always known each other. And when I was going out there for my last camp, I was like, Hey, Casey, I'm coming out here to train. I would like to get some work in with you. And, uh, you know, he took me under his wing. He's like, bro, I got you. We're going to go like team trainings this time. Just come in here with me. I'll get you introduced to everybody. And that's pretty much all that had happened. And, uh, you know, it's all about who, you know, and building relationships and maintaining those relationships. And, uh, you know, I feel like I have another team out there that supports me and, uh, helps me get ready. And that's exactly what we're doing for this camp as well. Yeah. Speaking of that, we see uh, you rubbing shoulders with Corey Sanhagen. I know that happened last camp as well. What's it like being able to train with someone who is so high up the mountaintop of this sport? It's, it's pretty freaking sweet. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, and, uh, you know, Corey is definitely one of my favorite fighters and being able to train with him is so surreal because you can't walk into a basketball gym and train with LeBron James, right? It's like, this is the only sport where you can actually walk into the gym and actually train with these guys. Um, it's awesome, dude. Like he, he gives me really good feedback. He beats me up a little bit and, uh, you know, that's all I could ask for, you know, a good teammate like him to be able to help me out, you know, give me advice since he's been doing it a lot longer than I have. Like, it's like, dude, all right, let's get this work in all right, what could I do better? What can I focus on? He's like, no problem, dude. You focus on this, 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 and this. And, you know, it's just pretty much just like that. And then even Chepe Mariscal, like he, he helped me last time I went out there. He, uh, we had a really good sparring round. And, uh, and then after another good conversation, he's like, dude, let me know next time you're out here. Let's get more work in. And then even this last trip, he came out, uh, after his, even though he was after his fight, he was still there at sparring, coaching everybody came over to me, started coaching me for one of my sparring, uh, sparring rounds. And, uh, then after he's like, dude, good work. Good job. You're going to be back out here. Let me know. I know this is what you want to do. You've got it in you. I see it. Like, let's get this work in man. Next time you're out here. So it feels good knowing that I can train with these high level fighters and I'm close to their level, you know? Yeah. I, I think about specifically, I mean, we go weight class and style. I don't know if there's another person that mirrors Joel Haro as much as a Corey Sanhagen. Have you ever thought about that? Like, man, if there's any reliable resource to reach out to, it probably would be this guy. Oh, de definitely. Absolutely. Like, uh, like with us having similar styles, he's like, dude, it's literally a game of who's going to stop moving. And He's like, that's when we're going to get hit the most is when we stop moving. So, um, you know, he gave me a lot of good advice and, uh, you know, he's, he's a super cool, super cool guy. And he was willing to work with me. And, you know, I'm very, very grateful for the opportunities. Circling back to the Bang Muay Thai thing. So did you start the Bang Muay Thai system when you faced Steven Starwalt going into that camp? Or was it long before that? How did you get incorporated with that style and, and, and with that camp? So when I started, when I was actually training at Absolute, uh, we went to a couple of Dwayne's, uh, Dwayne Ludwig seminars and, uh, I just, I, I fell in love with the style. I fell in love with the movements. I fell in love with that system in general. Um, and, uh, I would only train BMT over at the seminars. And then when we had branched off, opened up Sierra, I was never allowed to cross train at the previous gym. And so when we opened up Sierra, you know, Pedro's like, dude, I want you to train wherever you want to train. You need to progress. You need to level up. And so I reached out to Bobby King. I was like, hey, you know, I really want to train with you and train with your team. 
um, and along with the system. And when I reached out to him, I was actually going to spend a week out at HQ to go train out there just to make sure like, Hey, this is the, the style I want to train, you know? And, uh, and, uh, I started training with Bobby when I fought Kesley Collard, um, literally signed up the day I signed my contract and that's pretty much history ever since. And then, um, started going out to Colorado when I was training for, uh, the Styrewalt fight with Bobby, he took me out there. We both went out there and, uh, got some really good training in. And then, uh, it's like that. Ah, this is what I need to be doing to reach that next level, to level up my game, to you know, chase the stream. Do you think Sear is the best guy you've ever fought? You face some tough guys. I think specifically Yazan Haji is one of those higher touted names in the regional scene. Do you think Sear's the best you've ever faced? Uh, this is definitely the biggest fight in my career so far. He's six to one. I'm five and one. Um, I never overlook my opponents. I always look at my opponents as the toughest opponent that I'm facing. Because it's true, man. I mean, I'll give credit where credit's due. Michael Sears, like, he's good. He's really good. Uh, he's a really good grappler. Um, I just know I'm better. So May 31st, we're gonna we're gonna see who the champ is for sure. You won the belt, then you lost the belt. You had to get one back, and now you're back in that spot. How much does the belt motivate you? We've talked in the past and you've mentioned, you know, the belt isn't the end all goal for me. But it is, is it important for you to say, I'm going to take back what I believe I should still have because that was an uncharacteristic loss a couple of years ago? Oh, of course, man. Like, I'm like, yeah, the, the belt isn't the end all be all, but at the same time, it's, you know, my pants are falling down, bro. I need my belt back. <laughs> you know, but uh, I'm the number one, in, I'm, the, I'm the number one band weight here in Utah and having that belt just solidifies my my status here in Utah. And uh, it's also going to propel me to the next level with this fight as well. And, you know, it's just one of those mandatory things as a, as a fighter and as a champion that you got to keep on keeping on. Would you say right now, you just recently turned 30, would you say right now you're in your athletic prime? You said earlier you've never felt better. Do you think skill set wise you are more knowledgeable and more athletically adept to performing at your highest level right now than ever before. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I've been in the game for going on 16 years now, training and fighting. And I feel like within the last year, yeah, probably in the last year, I've really developed as a fighter, developed as a coach and as an athlete, taking my nutrition seriously, upping my training a lot more training with the best of the best and, uh, living the lifestyle of, of a fighter. Right. Um, cause you can't, you can't half ass it. You can't be a part-time fighter. You have to be all in because it's the hurt business as well, man. Like if you're not all in, you can definitely get hurt. Um, and if you really want to progress and chase your dream, why not be a hundred percent in and chasing your dream and, doing everything you can possible to, uh, to make that dream tangible. Did, so yeah, to answer your question. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> did you have kind of a moment where you were like, I need to lock into this thing. If this is going to be my career and what I want to do, or was it more just a natural progression of I'm starting to love this more and more. And I want to do this and this was, was there a moment or did it just happen over time? It just happened over time, honestly, um, specifically training for the Styrewalt fight. I, that's when I started making these trips, making, uh, uh, you know, more progress as a fighter, be taking my training more seriously and being the all around athlete, right. Training my boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, my wrestling, my, my, my jujitsu, you know, you have to dedicate that time to each art and that takes up a lot of time. Right. Um, uh, yeah, to answer your question, just a natural progression of this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm really good at. This is where my, this is, this is my path. This is my journey. This is my, my road to what I'm doing for right now, you know, and this, my dream ever since I started fighting and then turned pro, I was like, dude, I'm really good at this. I'm making a run while I'm still young. Cause you only live once, man. I don't want to look back and regret of, did I do enough to chase my dream and to attain my, my, my dream, my all end goal. Right. Um, so yeah, this is my life and 
what I was put on this earth to do. You're talking about your dream. You're talking about you were put on this earth to do this specific thing. For you, in your own words, how much does this dream and this journey mean to you? And how much have you had to protect it, defend it, and continue to move forward despite any roadblock that you have hit along these 16 years? Dude, it's it's everything to me, man. Like, you know, others will go to college, get a degree to get their job. And, you know, they had their career already set. Now, that's obviously not what you do for martial arts. It's sort of, you know, if you look at it this way, you're going to class. This is your schooling, right? What you're learning, every training session is your schooling. So um, outside of just like life things, like I, 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 you know, it's kind of a tough question, but um, it does mean everything to me. I, I, everything around my life revolves around this dream. Right. So like when I was looking for jobs, I'm like, all right, I need to be out of work by this time. Cause I need to be at the gym at this time by this time. Cause I need to be training. I need to have these, these times set off aside off so that I can dedicate this time for my fight camp. I need to do all these things that revolve around my dream. This is my, this is my dream here. Yeah. These, this job is great, but this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing with my life. And uh, I mean, it's been tough, you know, don't get me wrong. Cause this last year was, or year and a half ago was one of the worst years I've ever had uh, with injury, losing my job, getting in a car accident, losing the title. I was like, dang, this sucks. I'm gonna have to go get a nine to five job, you know, which, you know, I, I did, but I was still, you know, at the same time, making sure I still have time to get to the gym, to be doing all these things that I should be doing that I need to be doing. Right. Um, it's been tough, but you know, I have a really good team behind me. I'm surrounded by great people that support me. And we'll be there when I'm sitting at the top with the, uh, with the belt around my waist. I want to talk to you a little bit about the hypotheticals. Getting a win May 31st. Do you believe that that is, this is one of the last stepping stones before you get that national recognition, a PFL to reach out, a one championship, or even a Dana White contender series to reach out to you for something, moving your record to six and one? Uh yeah, I think so. Um, to be honest, I haven't really been f- like fo- too focused on that because I got to get through this fight first. You know, I, with every fight, I never look past the fight to see what uh, what else could happen because I'm focused on the task at hand and um, just focusing on my preparation so that I can go out there and perform. And then everything will be everything's going to fall into place. You know, once everything goes as planned, everything's going to go into place. So I don't really look too far forward, but yes, I mean, I've had, I I have had thoughts, but I mean, it's true though, because, you know, six and one versus a five and one guy, like people are going to be tuning into this fight for sure. There are two high level martial artists and similar records and finishers. So it's going to happen, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're talking about the task at hand. Last question for me. What are you most looking forward to on May 31st? I'm looking at, I'm really looking forward to getting my hand raised, getting that belt around my waist. And uh, I'm looking at, I'm preparing for a five round war, to be honest. Um, even though I want to get out of there and one, but Hey, like I said, Michael's a tough guy. I'm, I'm tougher. So this is going to be an exciting fight. People are going to be on the edge of their seats, probably not on the edge of their seats. Everyone's going to be standing and uh, you know, I can't wait, man. I can't, I, I really can't wait. I'm, my training camp's going great. Um, getting some really good exposure, getting some really good, good training sessions with high level athletes. So can't wait, man. Bantamweight belt on the line. Joel Haro opposite Michael Sear. Cannot wait for it. May 31st Maverick center tickets on sale right now at fierce fighting championship.com. Joel, thank you so much for the time, brother. Appreciate it. Dude. Absolutely. Um, I want to say a huge thank you to all my sponsors, FSC filtration, true culture, tattoos, CBD Essentials, Phase International, Air Temperature Solutions, um, and uh, FBC Roofing and Performance Performance Honda Bountiful. I'll probably jack that that name up. I'm so sorry, Jason. But thank you, everybody, uh, for, for riding behind me, having my back. And I uh, can't wait to see everybody out there May 31st. Everyone, go get tickets. Make sure to click on my photo and uh, be ready for fireworks. It's going to happen.